Hi, I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School, and this micro course is on the point spread function. The point spread function is a fundamental principle in light microscopy, and many of the concepts that we would like to understand about microscopy, both on a theoretical and a practical level, require an understanding of the point spread function. We're going to focus our discussion of the point spread function on resolution. The formal definition of resolution is the ability to distinguish objects that are separate from one another in reality in the sample as separate from one another in the image of the sample that is generated by the microscope. These are DIC images of nature's perfect test specimen, diatoms. Diatoms have pores in their silica shells that are very regularly spaced, and in some species the spacing between the pores is right at the resolution limit of the microscope. Both of these images were taken using the same magnification, but the image at the top used lower resolution optics than the image on the bottom. When we zoom in, it's clear that the higher resolution optics are required to resolve the pores, which are not visible in the lower resolution image. So why can't we always resolve the fine structures in our sample? In the 1800s, Ernst Abbe demonstrated that resolution in the light microscope is limited by diffraction. Diffraction results in what we call the point spread function. So we'll walk through the point spread function now and then we'll circle back to why the point spread function limits resolution. To understand the point spread function, I think it's useful to start by taking a close look at a theoretical point spread function just to see what it looks like. When a microscope is used to form an image of a tiny point source of light, the point spread function defines what the image of that point source will look like. To get the most accurate view of the point spread function, you need to look at a single point source of light that is below the theoretical resolution limit of the microscope. It'll become clear why as we work through this. To put this in more real world terms, let's imagine we are imaging a fluorescent bead, a sphere that's infused with fluorophore, and that is below the resolution limit of the microscope. We actually use fluorescent beads like this when we want to empirically measure the point spread function of a microscope. When we look at the lateral optical image of the bead, we're going to see a spot that is larger than the bead itself and that has a blurry edge. If we contrast enhance the image so we can see weaker intensity values, you'll see that the bright center is surrounded by dark and light concentric rings. If we draw a line across this image and look at the intensity of the image across that line, we'll see that the bright center, which we call the maxima, has a Gaussian-like distribution and that the outer rings are much dimmer than that maxima. We also see that the bead, still shown here for reference, resides in the center of that Gaussian. This XY image of the point spread function is referred to as the airy disk. The point spread function is three-dimensional, so I'm going to decrease the magnification of the bead so we have a larger field of view, and now we're going to focus up, and you'll see that the outer rings are outside of the focal plane as well, and they get larger as we go out of focus. So now if we collect a Z-series of the bead and build up an orthogonal three-dimensional reconstruction of the axial image of the bead on the right, you can see that the point spread function is beautiful. So that's what the point spread function looks like. Where does it come from? The point spread function is a result of diffraction and interference. Light propagates through space as a wave, and the amplitude of that wave determines the brightness. When thinking about diffraction, it's useful to imagine not just one light wave, but a bunch of light waves that are lined up in what we call a wave front. A wavefront is usually depicted by light and dark lines, which indicate the amplitude of the light waves. Diffraction is what occurs when the wavefront encounters a slit or an aperture. If the slit is equal to or less than the wavelength of light, the light that propagates through the slit will diffract. Diffraction occurs because light waves don't propagate in a simple straight line. Instead, they move as spherical wavelets. By using a slit to isolate a wavelet, we can see that the wavefront actually propagates as a collection of spherical wavelets. So what would happen if we add a second slit? This is the famous double slit experiment. You'll get the same spherical wavefront passing through that slit as well, and the two wavefronts will undergo what we call interference. 
Interference, on the other hand, is what happens when light waves encounter one another. If the peaks and troughs of light waves line up, the light waves are said to be in phase. If we add together two light waves that are in phase, the resulting light wave is going to have a greater amplitude. This is known as constructive interference. If the same two light waves are shifted in phase, the resultant light wave will have a smaller amplitude, and this is known as destructive interference. Going back to the double slit experiment, I said that the two spherical wave fronts are undergoing interference. Recall that the lines in these cartoons indicate the amplitude of the waves. So the interference pattern results because in some areas the waves have low amplitude, while in other areas the waves have high amplitude. To understand how we wind up with areas of low and high amplitude, it's useful to think about single waves within the spherical wave fronts. If two waves travel the same distance, when they reach each other, they're going to be in phase and constructively interfere, resulting in high amplitude. If, on the other hand, the two waves travel different distances, and when they reach each other, they're out of phase, they'll destructively interfere, resulting in low amplitude. Now we finally get back to the microscope. In the microscope, we don't have two slits, but there is an aperture in the back of the objective lens and diffraction occurs there. The aperture in the back of the objective lens is larger than the wavelength of light, so multiple spherical wavelets pass through. If we look at the amplitude of this interference pattern, we'll see that there is a bright central maxima surrounded by dark and light concentric rings, which I hope will seem very familiar at this point because that is our point spread function. So in summary, when we image a point source of light with a microscope, the light we collect from the point source diffracts as it passes through the back aperture of the objective lens, resulting in a three-dimensional interference pattern that we call the point spread function. When we talk about the size of the point spread function, we're generally referring to the size of the maxima. So an image of a small point source of light, as we've been saying, is going to appear as a point spread function in the image. Small points in your sample are therefore going to have this Gaussian shape of the point spread function maxima. And remember that resolution is defined as the ability to distinguish objects that are separate in the sample as separate from one another in the image of the sample. So as the point spread function gets bigger, the Gaussians blur together and we lose the ability to resolve objects. Let's look at equations that define the size of the point spread function and the resolution limit of the microscope. Notice that the point spread function is larger in Z than it is in XY. Resolution of the light microscope is worse in Z than it is in XY, and there are different equations for lateral and axial resolution. If we look at the intensity of the maxima in the lateral direction, it will have that Gaussian distribution we talked about, and the radius of the first minima is approximately equal to the width of the Gaussian at half maximal intensity, and is given by a constant, 0.61, times the wavelength of light used to form the image, divided by the numerical aperture of the objective lens. The intensity of the maxima in the axial direction also has a Gaussian distribution, and the radius is also approximately equal to the width of the Gaussian at half maximal intensity. This is given by two times the wavelength of light times the refractive index of the lens immersion media divided by the numerical aperture of the objective lens squared. These equations give us the distance two objects must be separated by in order to satisfy the Rayleigh criterion for resolution. The Rayleigh criterion states that if the maxima for one point spread function overlays the minima for the next point spread function, the image of the neighboring Gaussians will have a dip in intensity between them. There are other resolution equations that use different criteria, but this is the one that is most commonly used. Note that this works well if you know there are two objects, but it would not allow you to rule out that the objects might be fused together. If you use the highest resolution standard oil immersion objective lens with a numerical aperture of 1.4, the theoretical resolution when imaging green light is 240 nanometers in XY and 730 nanometers in Z. Just how big is the point spread function maxima relative to the sorts of things that we image? 
The volume of the Maxima when using a high NA objective lens is about 0.1 femtoliters. A GFP has a volume of about 30 times 10 to the minus 9th femtoliters. So that means that you can fit 3 million GFP molecules into the point spread function maxima. We've been talking about images of point sources and resolving two objects, but you're all interested in imaging stuff that's much more complicated than that. So let's think now about how the point spread function affects the image of your biological samples. The microscope optics convolve every point source of light in your sample with the point spread function. So you can think of this as stamping a point spread function on top of every point source in your sample. So the image of your specimen generated by the microscope is equal to your specimen convolved by the point spread function. So we start with your specimen, which is the reality. And it's as if the point spread function is a paintbrush of a particular size that's used to form the optical image of your sample. So a really important take home message here is that regardless of how small an object is in your sample, in a diffraction limited image of your sample, that object will never appear smaller than the point spread function. So one last cartoon example to help you think about how this works. Let's say you have two microtubules in your specimen and you've labeled them with one of the green fluorescent proteins conjugated to tubulin and you image them with a 1.4 NA oil objective lens. So microtubules are 25 nanometers in diameter and the point spread function for this optical setup would be about 240 nanometers. So each fluorophore in the microtubule will be convolved with the point spread function, resulting in an image like this. Note that you can easily resolve the microtubules in areas where they're separated by more than the point spread function, but not at all in the areas where they're closer than the point spread function. These are real diffraction limited fluorescence images of EGFP labeled microtubules. If we look closely at the axial image of the microtubules, you can see that each microtubule takes on a shape that's similar to the theoretical point spread function images we've been looking at. You can see the maxima and you can see the outer rings of the point spread function. You can also see that the image of the point spread function in the biological sample is not nearly as clear as the theoretical point spread function. The reality is that there are many other limitations on resolution from the specimen, from the microscope, and from the camera or photomultiplier tube that's used to detect and form the digital image. These limitations and some partial solution to these limitations will be covered in a 